Good day, LML487 student. This is Michelle Kukemur, one of your lecturers for this module. We thought it would be a good idea to have a discussion about your assignment one. Now, this is just to provide you with a general guideline and it should not be seen as us providing you with a complete or a detailed memorandum uh, for your assignment one. Uh, you will still receive a tutorial later 201 in this regard. Now, concerning your assignment, we had a few general comments. Firstly, and very important, you must read your case law. This is a skill that you eventually need to acquire, even for when you are in practice or where you are acting as a legal advisor. Eventually, you've got to learn how to do this. So at the start, avoid looking for a summary first. Don't always look for the quick way out. Eventually, it's going to catch up to you. Once you've mastered the skill, you can always try and find quicker ways which will assist you. But for you to acquire the skill, you have to put in the work. Now, I could see when I marked that some of you copied word for word from a specific source. Now, for me as the lecturer marking your assignment, I can award marks for your own work. The issue of copying from a source is that you never get to acquire the skill how to read a case. And that learning opportunity is lost. You will see where I marked, I would have highlighted those parts in yellow, which corresponded to that source, or where I could see you may have copied the gist of how that specific source was written. Please avoid this because we will not be as lenient in the examinations when you copy from your sources word for word. There's no excuse. You have to read your case and develop a skill to then put what you've read in your own words. What I also want to recommend is start getting used to including either a paragraph number or a page number from the case on when you discuss a specific aspect of that case. It gives your reader the impression that you've read the case and that you know what you're talking about. This will also be something that you would be asked to do one day when you present the case in a court of law. I've also picked up that some of you did not use the correct headings we provided. Now, this is an assignment, so we have to teach you a lesson that you will take further in your exams. In the exam, if you write something under an incorrect heading, we are not going to award any marks. So make sure that you stick to the structure that we provide for you to be able to obtain full marks for your exam questions. For your critical comment, we require from you to go and see what the existing law is on a specific aspect and then read the case and see whether the decision of that specific case changes the current law. Now, for this, you would have seen that we looked at the reversal of electronic funds transfers. So in your mind, you would have immediately thought to yourself, hmm, I need to then give a critical comment on how the law in this aspect might have been developed or changed. For your critical comment, we prescribed a journal article written by Schulze, where you would have then been able to get an expert opinion on what might have been wrong or right with the case. To be honest, I could see that very few of you read that prescribed article. Why not? It makes it easier for you to actually then also summarize the case. And it's part of your e-reserves. So why would you want to not read it? Please pay attention to the fact that we prescribe additional reading 
and that you must consult it when you work through your different lessons. For the facts, we awarded a maximum of three marks. Now in this, it was important for us to see that you followed the sequence of events. Firstly, you should have realized there were two different pistanas. Now I know some of you did not pick it up, which might have indicated to me that you did not read your case properly. Now the one pistana transferred funds to another pistana. But then you would have read that there was a SARS notice that was communicated to the head office of NetBank, but the detail of that notice wasn't sent to the Cartonville branch in time for them not to do the transfer to the second Spistana. Now, obviously, you would have then seen that the notice reached the branch and they then decided to reverse the instruction or the payment instruction that took place to the second Spistana, but without the consent of the Pistana which received the funds. Now this immediately places your case in the context of the topic that we are discussing this week, the reversal of an electronic fund transfer. For your legal issues, most of you would have gotten one mark where you provided something along the lines of whether a credit transfer is a completed and independent juristic act or I also awarded marks where you mentioned something to the effect of the mandate conferred by section 99 of the Income Tax Act. However, there was an additional legal question which you would have picked up only by a careful reading of probably the court of first instance case but also then of a specific part of the judgment. There was a hint in the judgment and you would pick you would have picked it up that it was a very subtle hint that the court had a suspicion something was going on between the two pistanos but they were bound to interpret the facts placed before it. Hence uniform rule 33. So this is why some of you might not have received your second mark. The application of that specific procedural aspect is important also to answering how the law could have been changed by this specific judgment. Now, I also encourage you to go and read the Schulze article where you will also find mention of this specific uniform rule. Now, when we ask you to discuss the decision, it is not telling me the Supreme Court of Appeal dismissed the appeal. I am asking you to discuss the decision, not tell me what the decision was. So what I'm after is you explaining why the court came to a specific decision. First off, you would have seen that the general rule usually is that if funds gets transferred, it belongs to the recipient of the funds. And if you want to reverse it, you must get consent from the person who received the funds. Then you will see that the, the, the judgment provides a lengthy discussion on the effect of the SARS notice. This basically goes back to what is the influence of the notice on the activities of the specific branch. And we talk about the constructive notice element there. So some of you would have provided a lengthy discussion. This for us is seen as one combined topic. There we might have given you a mark for referring to a lawful mandate, uh, ordinary everyday banking functions, and we might have also then given you a mark if you refer to the aspect that uh, whether it makes a difference if the Cartonville branch um, changed their mind. Then getting back to the place where there's a talk about law reform. The whole idea behind this case and why we prescribe this, for you to understand that there are already specific instances where you can reverse an electronic funds transfer. You remember there's other cases where we prescribe, for example, the joint stock case or the Nissan versus Marnitz case. Now, in those cases, we would have had a clear instance where 
reversal was allowed. In our set of facts, we didn't have a clear case of fraud. Remember I told you just now that there was a hint, a very subtle hint when you read the case, but the judge or the Supreme Court of Appeal was bound by the facts placed before it. Remember that old saying, you're as good as a lawyer that is assisting you with your case? In this instance, these were the facts placed before the court and this is also the facts on which, or these are the facts that the court adjudicated on. So there was no proof of a clear case of fraud. This is then also part of your critical comment. Now for your critical comment, I awarded one. I wanted you to go and read the Schulzer article we prescribed. It would have been so easy for you to, put, to draft your critical comment after reading this case. And also to check if you've summarized your facts correctly. In your comment, you should have gotten to the aspect that the normal rule is that you cannot reverse a payment of funds without the consent of the recipient. However, there are clear instances in our law where a reversal would be allowed. For example, in the case of clear fraud. Now, when I ask for a critical comment, I am not asking you to tell me the decision was correct or it was incorrect. I want you to tell me why you say it was correct or incorrect. I need your critical comment to be backed by facts or law. In the end, what I'm looking for is, do you think this judgment changed anything in our law? Or are we just continuing as is? Remember the case in which we prescribe is a Supreme Court of Appeal case. And you know that the Supreme Court of Appeal is the highest court for non-constitutional matters. So technically, it sets a precedent for law reform. Otherwise, we could have just told you to go and discuss uh, the decision of the court of first instance. Now, I hope you've learned from this presentation on how to approach any question concerning a case discussion. If you struggle still with the exact steps, go back to one of your previous lectures where Ms. Wagner explained to you how to summarize a case. I think a great idea would be to form study groups and then discuss the case law amongst yourselves. In the end, we are all legal scholars and we are all aiming to develop a skill. And the more you practice the skill, the more you're gonna have an edge above your competitors. So do yourself a favor, go and read the seven page case after you've gotten your results and then see if you agree with some of the comments we made in your assignment and if you think you can actually improve on what you presented as part of your assignment. Again, our contact numbers. If you want to have a chat to us about the assignment or about any other content related question, please contact us and we're happy to assist. We will then provide you next week with the second part of our discussion on lesson three, which will then be a discussion on the Banks Act. All of the best for the rest of your week and then also with your preparations for the upcoming examinations and your assignment too.